Okay. Talk she. Recorded live. Hey, it's Michael, and it's all the religion dystopia, and I got a, a new guest, and somebody that I th- believe is going to have a very interesting story to share with you. Um, and I'm going to ruin her name, <laughs> Ivani <laughs> Grepi. Grepi. Ivani Grepi. Ivani Grepi. <laughs> Ivane Grappi. I can't re- never could roll the tongue. You, you actually said <laughs> Grappi. I still can't. You did good. <laughs> it sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> it works, huh? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, she has a, a, a very interesting – she has a post. Uh, 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 you have a blog post, right? Correct, uh, yes. A blog, uh-huh. blog, uh, what's, what's the name of your blog? I mean, I shouldn't say post, a blog it's uh, in God's We Trusted. Okay. With small G. Because I got it's or there's also what about uh, Ivani Grepi dot WordPress dot com? Does that work as well? Yes, that's uh, to to sign in. The name of the blog is in God's We Trusted, but to sign in to the blog, it's Ivani Grepi dot WordPress dot com. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, well, you have an interesting uh, story to share. Uh, you know, it's interesting when I we were just talking a little bit before the recording, mm-hmm. um, and uh, you know, I was married to someone who was Portuguese and half East Timorese. He was born in East Timor and then uh, mm-hmm. grew up in Albana, the twin city of Lisbon, and. Uh, mm-hmm. I tried to learn Portuguese, and it turned out <clears throat> that I was learning Brazilian Portuguese. And so when I went over to Portugal, uh-huh. they all la- they all laughed at me. Right. And I said, well, it was so funny. He says, you're not speaking Portuguese. You're speaking Brazilian Portuguese. It, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you can compare it to um, American English and English from England and how – you know, it differs in how people look at it. You know, but Portuguese, you know, that's the, the real tongue and English from England is the real tongue. And then you have Brazilian Portuguese, which is like the Americanized version of English. So similar. Yeah. A lot of slang and things like that. Yeah. Well, you know, it's Portuguese the language which kind of reminds me of, of all things, the Chinese language in the sense that each province and um uh, and whatever they actually call it, and in China, <clears throat> they all speak Chinese, but no one understands each other because they all have like different dialects. And the, the, the and the how fast they actually speak, you know, mm-hmm. at least my part of co- the country, we speak real slow. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> if you want, if you want to be able to fall asleep, talk to somebody from the Great Lakes region because they'll <laughs> talk real slow, and you know so. <clears throat> And uh, it's good. It's it's uh, uh, much much better that way. I guess. But, through. You know, mm-hmm. but, but when it comes to the, you go to a place like uh, Portugal, then it's like, and you go to one province to the next, and it's like uh, everyone's dialect is a little bit different. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And you have to like so yeah, for whatever it's worth. So, but that's not what <laughs> we're here for today. We're here to talk about your uh, past life, mm-hmm. and then of course. How our great and mighty God, when our Lord and Savior mm-hmm. Jesus Christ got a hold of you and mm-hmm. freed you from the bondage of uh, sorcery and witchcraft. Mm-hmm. And, and um, But before we get going, I think uh, it would be apropos if I start us out in prayer. Is that okay? Yes, yes, please. Uh, all right. Almighty God, the true and living God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the only God that ever was and ever will be. And thank you, God, for that. Amen. Any Father, Almighty God, thank you for your only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the atoning sacrifice, and that through our Lord and Savior that we can reach out to you, have a relationship with you, and someday have e- eternal life and be in the presence of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and in the truth what real love is what real truth is and uh, 
what true meaning is. And I just want to say, God, thank you for for loving us, loving us enough to not let us go. You could have just let us all and let us all go. But like a loving father, you didn't do that. And I just want to say thank you, God. And I ask you humbly that you would please bless this conversation, and that no only you will Ivani and I uh, become friends and that I might by the end of the hour or two learn how to say her name properly God <laughs> but also that um, uh, that somebody out there will be blessed greatly from it and that they will know that there's an answer to their dilemma and their problems and the oppression that they're under um, God thank you for everything in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you, Michael. That was beautiful. Well, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, list. Now you have a te- your testimony that you can find on uh, Ivani Greppi. Ivani Greppi. Why would I not say the E? Okay. I'm sorry. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Just think either. of Italy. Except, like. No, there's, you- there's just. Uh, language, even the English language, language has never been my strength. Period. <laughs> it's not uh, easy to pronounce, Michael. It's fine. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's Ivani Greppi at um, WordPress dot com, and that's I B as in Victor A N I G R E P P I P as in Paul. That's right, and I'll make sure to put it in the information box. Okay. We, we posted up there on YouTube. Um, uh, where do we go with this? I think you know what uh, you're. You have a very lengthy and extensive uh, personal testimony, which tells me you have a lot to share, a lot to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, I don't know if the, if the best way to go about this one, uh, except that maybe we start from the beginning, if you're willing to. Sure. Uh, and I guess your your family history, your family life, you know, uh, how you mm-hmm. got into what you got into. And it's very interesting, at least name-wise, of a uh, form of uh, basically witchcraft. What do you call that name? Spiritism. Umbanda. Umbanda. Um, 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 Umbanda. 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 Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, which, uh, you know, it's – I uh, – one of the you know first times I ever heard it was through you, and I think uh, maybe Earthquake Kelly talked about it as well. Umbanda, Umbanda. Yeah. So and this is like a spiritualist medium, um, and what all that means. Now well, I go ahead. No, Umbanda Wait. is one uh, there in Brazil and throughout the, many of the Latin countries, a very similar type of religion that uh, was brought to. Uh, different countries in South America and the Caribbean by the slaves, African slaves. And Umbanda is one, there's Kimbanda, there's Candomblé, there's different uh, types, but they all worship gods or that are uh, synchronized, syncretized with the uh, Catholic saints. And I can explain that a little on further on as we go. But... Um, it, yeah, it's a it's a type of uh, it's spiritism where the people involved will uh, channel these gods, these spiritual beings, these spirit guides, and become possessed basically by them. Hmm. So there's ten p- uh, specific ones, huh? Uh, there are many different ones, mm-hmm. different types. Oh. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. And so basically what we're saying is there's demon worship, and people, but although most people don't realize that when they're involved in it, I imagine. Um, no, no one believes actually in a lot of uh, most – sorry, I can speak for myself. When I was a, uh, a spiritist, a medium, and for my family as well, we did not believe in demons. We, we believed there were dark spirits that, that lacked light. But uh, we didn't believe specifically in hell or heaven. Uh, we did not believe in that. And we, we did believe there were, quote, bad spirits, but there were uh, spirits that needed to come to the light. Basically, they all could uh, improve through different means. 
in 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 the spirit world. Interesting. Now, when mm-hmm. we say spirits within this particular, well, just to be honest, it's a religion. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, were they in particular talking about basically disembodied humans, the spirits of human beings? It, it's a mixture of human beings and, and different gods um, in Umbanda. Uh, they, uh, but they're also, for example, there are different lines of. Um, of spirits represented by, um, for example, water or thunder or lightning. Um, And then these are the the gods, they're called Orishas, and there are several different ones. But then you also have the disembodied spirits of slaves, which are are called, uh, they're called the old black men or old black woman that comes and possesses people. They're a spirit of children that uh, manifest. Uh, there are demons. Uh, I don't want to lead anyone in the wrong path here. Uh, we're, we know now that there are demons, but to people that are still um, do, do not know the truth of Jesus Christ and what these beings really stand for, they believe that you know the spirits of children that are gone or or slaves or uh, Indians. There's a lot of Indians, uh, uh, chiefs or just Indians in general. Um, And there's also spirits of uh, demonic-like beings that are worshipped as well. Hmm. Sounds sounds familiar, actually. It sounds like it has a lot of similarities to basically just about all of um, the Religions that are based on uh, spirit worship, um, mm-hmm. you know, and they do manifest themselves in all sorts of ways. Believe me, folks, I've oh, seen yeah. them do all all sorts of strange things. I've yeah. seen them. One of the things they're capable of doing, I notice, is uh, able to, to manipulate uh, material ma- matter, whether it's in the home or outside, mm-hmm. in the woods. A lot of demons in, out in the woods. I can tell you that much. And what they do is they can, they, they like, it's like a cross between dirt and maggots or flies or something. I mean, I think it's just a whole bunch of demons getting together and they form. And you can watch them form. They'll actually form into a, a, a shape or a silhouette or something like that. So, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, actually, I got I have to do a video on that. That's one of the things I've been taking uh, stills of. And so. Of that. So, anyways, so it's true that these demons will pretend to be just about anything—an old hag or old woman, a, a grandfather, uh, a grandmother, a sister that you know, a loved um, family member that passed away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, basically anything that you want them to be, whether uh, mm-hmm. like chameleons or like, uh, yeah. uh, they have, the chameleons best way of saying it, and they will. Um, they have the ability to, to morph and metamorph, and so it's it's so they're so e without the word of God and without uh, faith in Jesus Christ, it's so easy to be deceived by these things. Oh my gosh! Anyway, yeah. And when you finally do manifest themselves, which I've seen personally with my own eyes, they are about the hideous, and most ugliest things you've ever seen in your life, and you never want to see one again. And that's right. what most people who don't know Jesus are going to spend an eternity with. And that's a yeah. terrible thing. That's why it's so important to do what we're doing because uh, it, if you don't get saved, folks, these awful-looking things and they're like cockroaches. They're everywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're gonna they're gonna just ruin your life now and then torment Correct. you for all eternity. Yeah. Just because yeah. you simply did one thing, you didn't do just one thing. You didn't fall on your knees and ask Jesus Christ if He is real and have Him to come into your life. Amen. And that's not religion, folks. No, that's reality 101. Yeah, that's, that's having life. a relationship with Christ, and they there's no room for evil. I mean, they they flee from from His name, from His power. It's the, he, He's above power above all all names and uh, it's just that the deceitfulness that uh, goes on with the occult in so many areas uh, you know you can call it Umbanda 
spiritism, whatever you want to call it, it's the same thing. It's just deceitfulness that they they just come to take us away from salvation in any way they can to keep us from knowing who Christ is. Right. So that's their well, ultimate goal. All these religions are all based on witchcraft, which basically is the the use of these demons to either be manipulated by them or to use them to manipulate others. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's what it comes down to, really. I mean, in a nutshell, it's just, and it's evil in its own premise. So, so anyways, we go back to you, and let's talk more about the beginnings here. So uh, you're in an environment where Umbanda and other sorts of uh, uh, basically witchcraft practices and spiritualist practices were being used. and uh, mm-hmm. So it's all part of your life. So, I mean, and I know yeah. where you're coming from because I used to be like a New Ager and I was, uh, mm-hmm. I went from being a Mormon, become an alcoholic, to, you know, mm-hmm. divorced, to being a member of AA, then to uh, being part of the New Age movement before God finally, you know, had enough. So, um, okay. But, you know, uh, all that time, you know, I thought I was doing right and doing good and had no idea I was entertaining exactly. devils. Right. We, and, we uh, all believe that wholeheartedly. We right. Were, we weren't evil people. We we thought we were doing these things through God and that by being, by having these, uh, contacting the spirit world was a gift from God. And so the, that's the number one seat right there um but i didn't uh get involved in the umbanda religion until i was a teenager and uh, like you mentioned my my whole i was born into um family that practiced spiritism for generations before i was born um and i don't know if you want me to go on uh telling you a little bit of the background now or if you have yeah that's a good way to start yeah let's do okay that. well i was born in brazil and brazil um is a melting pot of cultures and and different um nationalities and i i think just to put it into perspective for the listeners a lot of people are familiar with the fact that Brazilians are just like Americans uh, where we have most of our uh, bloodlines come from uh, European uh, or African uh, mixed bloodlines. So my family, my mother's side of the family, her grandparents came from Spain. They immigrated to Brazil from Spain and they were already practicing spiritism back in Spain. My father's Italian grandparents, paternal side of uh, his family, came from Italy, and his grandmother, my great-grandmother, was a healer uh, from Sicily and um, who had a lot of uh, healing powers and was sought out to help people in the neighborhood. They also immigrated to Brazil and brought with them these beliefs from um, the old country and then in brazil it's it was already established that even though it's called the catholic country the main uh practice the main religion practiced it was spiritism in probably most aspects of uh, all, all all types of uh, levels of society so when they came to brazil it was it was just a matter of bringing what they believed and kind of like mixing what's already there in the culture in the Brazilian culture. So, um, as, as I grew up in this family, when I was born, uh, my mother believed that even as an infant, I was already seeing the spirits, you know, the spirit world because of the way my eyes tracked around. And, um, as a baby, a lot of times I would, cry out and she could see my eyes tracking until and she would sense something in the room and they all believed in spirits they all believed in channeling because my grandmother my mother's mom and dad were both mediums and they both channeled spirits of um 
like my grandmother had a spirit guide that was a doctor that did healing. My grandfather had a spirit guide that was a, an Indian chief that also healed. And, you know, we say channeled, but it's based, it's possession of these spirits that would take over. And um, so I grew up around that. And from an early, early age, um, I was seeing, I, I had what they call the gift of um, videnti, which means you can see the spirit uh, realm. And I could see all the time from as far back as I can remember, I always saw spirits roaming around, mostly uh, what they call shadow people. And of course, as a child, I was petrified. I was always uh, so scared because not only did I see them, I sensed their presence kind of like hovering around at, on top of me all the time. It would wake me up and I experienced uh, sleep paralysis as a as a young girl. Um, it was so bad that I, I was never comfortable being alone in a room. Uh, to my younger sister was my chaperone. She would go with me everywhere, including the bathroom. I was so scared. And because I sensed these spirits, I saw them, um, I would run out of the room if I was even for a second. Sometimes my mother would get angry, just go and go in the room and get something. And I would go with trepidation because I knew that as soon as I walked there in a room by myself, I would feel threatened. The threat was always there. And I would just run out and bang into walls, fall, sometimes feel like you're being pushed or shoved. And I had bruises and um, all over my legs, always constant. I grew up with bruises all over my legs. It was a constant thing. I never had time to heal because I was always bumping into things and running and falling away, trying to run away from these things that were always there. I saw them in school. I saw them when we were outside playing in the sunshine. You know, I could never play hide and seek because I couldn't be in a, under the bed or anything like that because I was so scared uh, that they were, it, it always felt like they were wanting to hurt me. So that was my my childhood in Brazil up until I was nine years old. And before I, that's when I came to the United States, but before we came to the United States, I I had an experience where I saw the uh, a, a spirit that was totally manifested as a human being, not just a shadowy form that would um, be roaming around, going through walls and things like that. It was an actual, it looked like a flesh and blood person. I didn't know. I was little, probably seven, six or seven at my great grandmother's house. And this entity walked in through a locked gate and I thought that it was a, a person invading our the property and my aunt was feeding the dogs in the backyard and what and I was paralyzed awake it was just like sleep paralysis and I was wide awake but I was paralyzed I couldn't scream out thinking you know this man was coming to to hurt us or rob us you know and when he reached my aunt he turned into a puff of smoke and disappeared. And that's when I was released from that paralysis and screamed out. So the next day, my aunt, my great grandmother took me to her medium friend who confirmed that I had the gift and I was, I would be a medium someday, but I was too young to develop my mediumship um, uh, talents at that time. So the only thing that my mom could do would be, to uh, do these rituals, which was, you know, incense, putting salt in the house, uh, these um, rue, you know, we used rue a lot, which is uh, an herb, I don't know if you're familiar with it, that is supposed to keep, you know, the evil eye away. So that was my childhood in Brazil. So, and that was up until 1968 when we came to the United States. Now the shadow people is they're called vo, uh, voltos. V- voltos. Uh-huh. voltos, 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 uh-huh. or encostos, which means um, the um, in English it would be um, I have it here uh, attachments. So uh, e- 
the Vultu, which is like a shadow type of um, person, or attachment, which, you know, they basically these demonic beings attach themselves to to people and follow them around and and do different things to either hurt them or scare them. So, yeah. And then you you were going to be it was a uh, event eventing. Videnti, like videnti means you can see the spirit world, which I already was supposedly. You know they they said this gift was <laughs> from birth. Not much, not much of a gift, is it really? No, <laughs> it was a curse. It was a curse. <laughs> we didn't know back then, but we we thought again. We really believed it was from God. And again, my family, they all were wonderful, loving people that use these, uh, like my grandparents who um, were mediums and and channeled their spirit guides, they healed. And the, the thing is, Michael, that a lot of people don't realize that these spirits, they have some power, they have power, they have power to, to do certain things, but there's a price that comes attached to it. You know, they they... They do, they kind of said everything that Jesus Christ can do and, you know, especially healing of a disease, but it's only a temporary thing that will manifest. It's almost like you're exchanging, you're you're exchanging something temporary for eternal damnation, basically, and people don't realize that that's what these spirits are doing. And they, there's, we've seen many people be healed in our families from minor things to major, you know, and it was through these spiritual uh, guides that people would um, channel and would heal. And there's, I'm sure you've heard um, similar to, very similar to um, Johanna Michelson's story where she um, worked with, I don't know if you've read her book, it's very powerful. I, have, I know, I know, I know who she is, and I've listened to her testimony. Certainly, yeah. it's the, the um, because it's the beautiful, beautiful side, side of, of evil. Evil, yes. Yeah, and yeah. she, you know, she got involved in Mexico with a healer that, you know, they they did uh, surgeries and operate. So we ex- we uh, witnessed that, uh, and some members of our family were had surgery and things like that and were healed. But again, it's all in. Uh, they have a limited power to deceive only. So there's always that. a price to pay. Always mm-hmm. a price to pay it on the back end of it all. Yeah, yeah. I, I know. Yeah. When I was in the New Age movement and didn't realize I was practicing witchcraft, but it was and doing like the mm-hmm. secret and vision mm-hmm. board and, and doing all these things and yeah. getting what I want. <clears throat> I I'm still paying the price today with my health. Yeah. And what's going on with my son, oh. and her mom, and his mom, and everything. So I mean, I there's such a heavy price to pay. So I got what I wanted at the time, though. But right. you know what? It's all the price is being paid. So it's yeah. uh, and uh, you know, well, they, you know, thank goodness I don't have to at least eternal damnation as long as I hold on to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and uh, you know, work, Amen. you know, work. We're supposed to work out our salvation, fear, and trembling. So, and yeah. you can't just, just you know. Mm-hmm. But if we have faith and believe in Jesus, and He will give that to you if you ask for it, then yeah, there's he will. A, He'll transform you. But you know, I can tell you from my own personal experience that, yeah, this this uh, a magic, which turns out to be basically a form of ritual magic with the vision boards and mm-hmm. you know uh, the meditating and to. A drawing out what you want and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I got what I wanted. I mean, one of the things was that I always thought about my high school sweetheart, right? Mm-hmm. For years, 16 years after we broke up, always thought about it, you know, all the time, every day. Mm-hmm. And guess who showed up? And I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't surprise and, uh, me. And mm-hmm. it was a total, absolute disastrous mess. It wasn't very long. It was a, it was a month fling in romance, quote unquote romance, as far as the world is concerned, you know, which basically mm-hmm. meant uh, committing adultery and fornicating mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And but, uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. and but man, the price that was paid afterwards for that—that that was just one. And then, um, 
you know, I was a very um how much of a, I guess I was a you know, I was a womanizer and uh, and um and women were part of my uh I guess my identity. I used to be a, a handsome man. <laughs> now I'm mm-hmm. 50 years old. <laughs> and it was I got a belly That's and young. But <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, there's a time, you know what I mean? And that's what I prided myself in and always Mm -hmm. having a beautiful woman by my side and all that kind of stuff. So, but I look back at it now and it was, um, a very heavy price to pay. And, uh, Mm -hmm. and, and it was like, uh, you know, uh, they they, they sent me what I wanted, but man, oh man. You pay for it. Oh my yeah. gosh! You know yeah. now, no, 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 now, man. I put my trust in God. And if I was a younger man, I'd say, you know, I, I don't care. I'm finding myself a woman that actually has a relationship with God. I am not going down this road. I know yeah. what the price is, and it's a terrible price. And then yet, it's a generational thing. And even though I pray, mm-hmm. you know, for all these generational curses to be broken, and but you know, the price is the price, and even you know, there's only so much. God will do, or, and uh, I mean, He can do all things if He wants. He can change it all, but He knows what's mm-hmm. best. And so, um, yeah, I see the price even happening with my son. So it's like, yeah. uh, and He will that. use, you know, He will, even though it's hard for us to understand sometimes going through, you know, as Christians, He never promised that we would have a perfect life. That's not why we, he, he's just a loving God. And a lot of times we go through things we don't understand. Um, but he will use all for good. And um, there are many, many bad things that eventually will turn into blessings. But we need to trust him. That's all we can do. And, oh, yeah. and just believe guess- that he's in control. That's all we can do. Yeah, it's true. You know what I mean? If it wasn't for all the bad things that happened to me, thanks to right. uh, him allowing me to be handed over to these demons for a season, mm-hmm. I would never have turned him. So, I mean, and, and right. it, it's, you know, so, you know, you have this comparison now of uh, what life would be without him. And um, oh. and he and I think sometimes he allows that thing to, to, to continue in family, including family members, because. I know that. So uh, as we go on here, talking about your your life, I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, you had to break away from quite a bit. Um, you had you needed to have the strength of God to, to go through quite a bit. So, so yeah, now you're and, in, about nine years old or so, and um, you're now everyone's you know, your family members are saying, "Hey, you got this great gift. Right. You're a vendent, a vidente, vidente." Yes, it basically it translates to seer. You know, you're a seer. You can see the spirit realm. And that's not unique. Like, I wasn't a, a unique, you know, and it wasn't unique. There are many, many people in my family that had the same, the experience the same. Um, everyone believed in spiritism. Not everyone was a medium. And there are only certain people that actually went through, you know, the the motions of um it's called the um, mediumship training that you actually, you know, receive. It's called receive, but become possessed by by these spirits and and channel them. But everyone in my family, my my immediate family, my aunts, uncles, cousins, all believed in this and all practiced it in some form or another. It was what we believed. We believed in a God. We always believed in it. We always said, God, God bless you, and uh, God willing. But the God we believed in was this kind of mystical figure that was an, an energy, the new agey type of God that, you know, that uh, it's an en- energy. He's everywhere. He's, you know, he's the sea. He's the sun. He's the ocean. He's, a, he's uh, the wind. So that's God. That was God for us. And Jesus, right. Jesus we knew we always believed in Jesus and a Jesus, and this Jesus was a medium. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, when he walked on earth, he was a medium. He was a very elevated, one of the highest elevated spirits in the spiritual realm. 
after God. So that's we we didn't we never believed he was the son of God. Uh, we did not believe in the Bible whatsoever. And just going back a little bit, um, as far as my family, the, the my grandparents and the mediums that we attended the before Umbanda, before I was involved in the Umbanda sect, the um, it was called um, it was type it was like a seance seance type of thing, where you would go weekly and it was a table. It's, it was called white table, and that's also known in the Caribbean. They they do the same thing, and again, it's, it's related to. It's it's a mixture of, um, and I'll get to that in just a second. But um, basically, it's seances that we would go every week, and the mediums would channel uh, departed uh, souls, uh, and there were all spirits of light that did healing and did things uh, would help um, other like myself, you know, from attacks when I was little, and they would prescribe teas or rituals for my mom to do to keep the because. The way they described it was because I was a medium and I was too young to develop and control the spirits. I was like a magnet that they would be attracted to and wanting to communicate through me. But uh, it would also, um, unfortunately, because I was so young, I would attract the lower level spirits of light that were evil in a way that that did uh, manifest in a way that scared me and, and so forth, but they couldn't harm me. That was what I was told. But, you know, you tell that to a kid that's, you know, all our life is seeing these shadows going around, walking around and going through walls and and hanging around everywhere you go. It's They were scary. And, you know, no matter what they told me, I was, I was always afraid. But so we went to these weekly, you know, it was like going to church. So it was a seance meeting um, and it's, it was called Meza Branca. And my grandmother, uh, my grandfather didn't like to go. He he would channel his spirit guide at home, but my grandmother would participate. And, and they did it at home too, where people would come and be blessed or have the healing passes. It's similar to Reiki techniques, which people think are just energy now, but it's, connected to demons, you know, and that's what they did. It was called uh, passes. So if you were sick physically or spiritually or emotionally, you would get these energy passes through the spirits and you would feel better for a little bit, you know, and then it would come all back again, crashing down on you. So that was my, uh, up until I came to the United States in 1968. Well, we also obviously believed in reincarnation. We believed um, in the karmic law, you know. So that was a big, big part of our belief system. Hmm. Yeah. Sounds exactly like the New Age. <laughs> it, it is. It, it, it just, exactly it just, it is. It's just, it's just mm-hmm. tied a little different thing and, and, oh, and yes. kind of packaged a little different. It's all it. the same. Oh, just, yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard. Uh, so going back to the, the seances, they were based on... Um, teachings of Alain Kardec, who was uh, a spirit guide of uh, a French philosopher and and teacher in the 1800s, who codified um, spiritism. So spiritism kind of branched off from this French uh, uh, professor. It was in the early 1800s, and it started in Europe, and then uh, it came to Brazil. And so many, many people in Brazil still uh, will follow Alain Kardec's teachings, which we followed. That was like our Bible. And what he did is he he took the Bible, the Gospels, and he rewrote them as far as what the spirits, the gu- spirit guides told him the truth was because what was taught to us was that Christianity was not truthful and the spirit world knew exactly how to interpret the scriptures so there he has uh, the book is called uh, um, the gospels according to spiritism and that's what we believe so there's a mixture of biblical you know just a little sprinkling of biblical uh, truth in there with a lot of lies from satan to just take you totally away from salvation you know just to keep you depending on 
your own doing what on works, you know, what you do is how how good of a person you are and you know, and then you come back again, you die and then when you come back again you will pay for your past mistakes and you repent not repent to God but you will um become a little higher, you know, as far as your spiritual um light goes and then you come back again until eventually you're such a enlightened spirit that you no longer need to come into uh, the flesh of any any human body because we're truly spiritual beings, which is true. I mean, the Bible says that, but not in the way that they teach. So that was, you know, our goal is to eventually not have to come back and be reincarnated again. So... That was that was part of the huh. the teachings. Mm-hmm. Sounds very familiar, and it's something yeah. that you know I grew up with in, in my own right. You know, with the combination of uh, Mormonism and mm-hmm. um, and then you know, well, I did have a miracle the other night. Uh, my mom finally, finally, because she's been suffering from her health issues, so I've been going there. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the evening, in the morning, and that kind of thing, and help her get out of bed and go to the toilet and all that stuff. She's, you know, it's, it, it is time uh, to finally get rid of your or tarot cards and your uh, oh, books on goodness. tarot and on yeah. the astrology and all that because they're contributing to your health problems. Is so right she now? did it. Yeah. Oh. She, 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 so she threw them out. Uh, she allowed me to throw them out at least. Mm-hmm. So they should be somewhere in in a garbage truck running around about now, and um, there you go. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes it takes to – God has to use desperate, desperate means to, to wake up yeah. a desperate person. So, But, yeah, you know, so that was, you know, along with being taught, you know, Jesus Christ. And, and mm-hmm. yeah, so – and then, and you can see how, you know, um, uh, superstitious religions um, – they come out of it, Catholicism goes along with mm-hmm. it. I mean, witchcraft is so much a part of all of this. So, yeah. but you don't know that because you never taught that, and, and, and the vast majority of people never bothered to really sit down and study the Bible and to actually ask God to come into your mm-hmm. life and actually to quicken you to the Holy Spirit to actually understand it. Then you start to really understand the, the spiritual nature of the book, and it has it's the complete opposite of what the world has been told me at least. It is. Yeah. It is a, mm-hmm. Sounds like the same yeah. for you. So, mm-hmm. so, so, yeah. but you're here. You're getting this whole basically the thing. This all the, basically what's in the world, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and um, so it's very natural for you. So, so you, um, you know, you're um, you're learning this stuff. You're learning about all this basically, quote unquote, super superstition, which is really a form of idolatry and it's a form of uh, witchcraft. Is what we're really dealing mm-hmm. with. Um, yeah. What's the next mm-hmm. phase of all this? Tell us the next phase. Well, when um, when I turned nine, um, we moved to the United States, and it took a long time for us to get our visas, even though my father's mother was American. She was born in Massachusetts. And that's a very long story, and it's pretty convoluted, but basically she only lived in the United States until she was six and eventually immigrated to Brazil and then came back again. So it was like full circle. So in 1968, we immigrated to the United States, to Massachusetts. And uh, one of the concerns my mom, my parents had, uh, was that because I had this, you know, gift, this problem, whatever you want to call it, where I was always being attacked and I always saw spirits, where would we get help? Because back then, uh, nobody, it's not like now. Now you can go anywhere pretty much here in the United States and you can find, uh, you know, a spiritist center. You know, it's especially here in Florida where we have so many Brazilians. Where in Orlando, um, I mean, they're everywhere, but um, there are several uh, spiritual centers that practice these things here. In the, in the United States now for the Brazilian community, you know. Mm-hmm. So ba- back then we didn't have anyone to turn to for help. We thought, you know, it was it was helpful, which it wasn't. But it was only like adding fuel to to a fire. And um, so what my mom would do is get whatever herbs she could. Uh, you know, we had the little 
A and P stores, and we couldn't tell anybody what we believed because nobody in the United, in in uh, my my grandmother's family they were very Catholic. They didn't know, and we we were afraid to tell anybody about what we believed and what you know what I experienced seeing these spirits and things like that. So um, we basically for five years just my mom would do the rituals the best way she could at home, herbal baths, the, these things that related to negative energy, to, re, you know, remove the en- negative energy, salt in the room, and herbs and things like that. And my grandmother in Brazil, who was a medium, would send books, you know, for us to study, and she attended the, the Mesa Branca, which was the seance type of uh, rituals, religion. In our, in our behalf to help with uh, you, our you guys call program. that you mm-hmm. call that the white table now what mm-hmm. shape of that table is our curiosity oh it's just a, it was just like uh it, it was actually in it could be the, the one we attended was in someone's home so it was like a dining room table like a, a rectangle table with a um it wasn't round like you see in a lot of the seances it was an actual rectangle table with a Okay. A white linen or white lace tablecloth, and there were, you know, always incense candles, flowers. It was always always white. There, everybody had to wear white. The mediums, and there were rituals that was done before. You know, they had to be, uh, you know, no smoking, no drinking, no eating for a certain amount of time before they were able to uh, channel the spirits. You know, many different rituals that they. Uh, that they uh, participated in, but um, yeah, so that was, uh, so the, I lived in the United States for five years without having any, I continued to see this, this, experience the same exact things that I did in Brazil, but we didn't attend any of the, obviously, meetings because there was nowhere to go, and we would go to church, Catholic church, because it was a uh, not because we believed in any of the teachings of the Catholic Church, but because it was a traditional, very traditional thing for Brazilians and Portuguese, and we were in a big Portuguese community. Um, it, you know, weddings were at church, baptisms were at church, children's children baptism, uh, first communion. So we we did all that while living in the United States. I had my first, but we never were members of, excuse me, of a church or anything like that. We just did the the rituals. It was just part of a celebration, you know. And but we never, I never remember until later on, you know, until I was thirty eight years old. I never remember someone witnessing to me about Jesus Christ and and mm. what He did for us. So all these years, we were under the impression that we were doing the right thing, that we believed in the right things, and we never did anything to hurt anyone spiritually it was if there was anything bad uh, that uh, sometimes the spirits would say oh there's a curse that was sent uh, at you and it's broken now and you have to light these candles and do this to you know to end this curse in your life so but even though again we know now that all these things are demonic back then we thought we were serving the the white side of the um, spiritism, which was only good, and we only did good, only healing, a lot of works, you know, helping the poor and things like that. So mm. that's that's pretty much it. And then uh, when I was 14 years old, well, one thing that did happen a little differently while I was living in the United States, my intuition and this uh, psychic abilities, I, as I got older, also became stronger. So I had a very, very strong sense of intuition, and I had a lot of dreams that would, like dreams that would tell of things that would happen or were going to happen. And uh, so that was a... It gave me a sense of power, and you know, as a teenager, you start to think, well, you know, you kind of, oh, you're gonna, you know, what's coming uh, in the, at school, uh, what kind of test, and I, 
you know, I, I did great in school. I learned English, very intelligent kid, and but I also feel like a, a lot of things, a lot of my knowledge came from the demonic realm, and I, you know, I kind of force, I would foresee a lot of things that you know kids shouldn't, shouldn't, but that was given to me as again as a gift slash curse. So. So uh, at 14, my parents, my mom did not want to stay in the United States because she missed the family and the culture and everything. And we lived in Massachusetts, which was totally opposite weather-wise, you know, the snow. We had never experienced that before. So at the age of 14, my sister 13, we went back to Brazil to live with, and my cousins also lived with us here, but the four of us returned to Brazil to live with my maternal grandparents. And my parents and aunt and uncle stayed behind. They were just trying to save money to go back to Brazil and buy a home, even though my dad did not want to go back to Brazil. So as immediately, as soon as I returned to Brazil, I um, it intensified, you know, the the uh, spirituality part. And because my entire family practiced, and my grandmother still channeled, you know, spirits and things like that. I was immediately immersed right right back into it, but um, I had an interesting experience where we were watching TV one day, and that was not long after we went back to Brazil, and I wasn't involved in, in Banda yet. We were watching TV, and I saw, and this is the second time that I saw an entity that looked like flesh and blood, even though this time, it was, it's hard to explain, but it was, I, ha, I saw the features, the clothes, the buttons on the car, everything you can imagine, but it was translucent and it was a bluish form. And I could see through him, it was an older man that was very angry trying to talk to us. And this is why we we're all watching TV in the living room. And again, I became paralyzed to the, you know, where I couldn't scream out or say anything until the entity turned around and left the room. So when I, just like when I was younger, I screamed out and started crying. And um, my grandmother was upset with me and took me to the kitchen. And she said, I I know what you saw. I saw the same thing. So she described the same exact thing that I saw, the the old man. And she said, that was my grandfather. And you shouldn't be afraid. And by this time, you should know better. You've been, you've been a vidente all your life. You need to develop your skills as a medium. So you need to go back to the Mesa Branca, which is the white table, and, and study uh, Alan Kardec, go back to studying, and, and go develop your mediumship um, talents. But, you know, my aunts, who were not much older than, than I was, my, my mom was the oldest daughter and and my aunt, my uh, she was only 18 when she had me, so a lot of her sisters were very close to my age. They were not much older. I told them what happened, and I was upset because I didn't know what to do. And they invited me to go to the Umbanda temple with them when I was 14. And that's when you you read in my story that that's when I began developing as a medium to actually, I was actually channeling these, these um, entities that we believed were gods or spirits of, you know, children or slaves. But my my main, you have different guides, but the, the primary spirit guide that I was, that God, you know, the small G, assigned me to was uh, called Yamanja, which she's a goddess of the sea, and that's the spirit line that would possess me was a, a water spirit. Hmm. So, yeah. so this we're talking now, I think this is part five of your written testimony. Um, mm-hmm. Fascinating testimony. Um, this water god, huh? How do yeah. you pronounce it again? Yemanja. She, Yemanja. Okay. Yemanja. And she's a, uh, supposedly beautiful woman, a goddess, and she comes from the sea, and people worship her. Um, she's, re- uh, remember I told you that uh, the 
Umbanda gods uh, syncretized with Catholic saints. She is related to um, uh, Mary. So even though she, you know, she manifests as, you know, she comes from the water, she has long black hair, and in Brazil, she's a very, you, you see her in so many different um, buildings and, her and, you know, the image of this goddess uh, almost everywhere. And New Year's is her day because they also have different days of the year that you worship these gods, but even though you worship them all the time, but they have specific days uh, assigned to them. And New Year's Day is the day of um, Yemanja. So if you ever look that up on the internet, especially Rio de Janeiro. Um, it's all over Brazil, but Rio de Janeiro is the biggest because of the Copacabana Beach. And the whole entire Copacabana will be lit up with candles and uh, people will be on the sand doing rituals to her and doing offerings. And there'll be, you know, thousands and thousands of people giving her roses and perfume and things like that. And that happens, still happens all the time. I mean, it's a, it's a part of the culture and it's part of what they believe. So it, people want to start the new year worshiping Yemanja because, you know, she is like married to the Catholics. So. Mm, very interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's let's, let's talk. Uh, uh, so you guys was kind of go moving back and forth in this period, back to the Brazil and then back to the United States, and right. and, uh, I, and you had your I, sister, and then just she was getting married, and then tell us more about that. What was going on there? Well, when when we lived, when I was fourteen, and we went back to Brazil, and I became involved in Umbanda. We only stayed there for two years. Um, my parents came back a year, about a year and a half after we did, and they only stayed a few months. It was not feasible for for us to to stay. My my dad couldn't find a job, and he, you know, he did not like the culture there. He couldn't. He just didn't want us growing up in that environment. He didn't like. He hated the fact that I was going to the Sumbanda religion. My mother didn't like it either, because as funny as it is, even though everybody believes in spiritism. Um, my grandmother didn't like that either because they, she believed that because there was openly worship of uh, these evil beings once a month, you know, there was also, the, you know, there was a dark side to it that she didn't like, that she believed the uh, Mesa Branca, the white table, was white light only, and we were mixing with the dark side, which was true, but everything was the dark side we didn't know that and we so when i went back to so i came back to the united states and how did that happen i'm trying to think oh yes we went we came back to the united states and i brought all my um paraphernalia you know i had all my occult stuff which was um, my uh my gods goddess uh, the little statues the beads that we wore around that neck um candles I bought and lit for them and I continued doing the worshiping but I was told never to allow possession of the spirit guides because it was very dangerous without a a meeting because I was still going through the process of you know I was still going through the process of developing and it could be dangerous and you know they a, a spirit that wasn't my guide could manifest and 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 act like it, but actually not be my spirit guide. So there was so much deceitfulness in, in the teachings that made sense back then. But now when I think back, it's like, wow, why, we didn't see through this craziness. But So I came back to the United States. My sister uh, was dating her. She's still married to him, by the way. They uh, met at that time while we lived in Brazil in we came back because we didn't want my family to separate. My parents were ready to get a divorce at that time because of the Brazil, America, America, Brazil. So we came back to Massachusetts again. And um, I started uh, going out with my husband, who I'm married to now. And the funny thing is, he he is also from Brazil. And his grandmother was a priestess 
and um, not Umbanda, but Candomblé, which is similar uh, religion in Brazil. So she, she grew up the same way I did with spiritism and um, his grandmother channeling spirits. So we, right away, you know, it was very comfortable because I could talk to him about what I experienced and he understood. So um, when my sister was 16, like you said, she, her husband wasn't allowed to come to the United States back then. And this is in the 70s. You know, we're waiting for, for a visa for him. And there was it wasn't possible because um, you needed a family member or to be married. So she went back to Brazil to get married, even though she was only 16. My dad didn't want her wanted her to wait. She was so young, um, and we couldn't attend the wedding because we had recently moved back to the United States, and my parents bought a home and everything. So, but she became pregnant a few months later, and before she was ready to give birth. I graduated from high school, which uh, it took me like two and a half years to graduate through high school because um, I was left behind in Brazil. They wouldn't allow me to go to school. That's another long story, but the government there wouldn't accept my, uh, because I only went up to eighth grade here. And then in Brazil, the two years I was there, I didn't go to school, but I was able to make it up. So I graduated in 77. And that's when my uh, sister was ready to give birth. And we all went to Brazil. And she gave birth to the, she was 17 at the time. She gave birth to this little boy. And four days later, he died in a hospital. And, you know, it was pretty devastating for all of us to be there, especially for my sister, so young, having a loss like that, and her husband. So I went to uh, the Umbanda temple where I used to attend before and I was trying to channel, you know, Yamanja to be able, because I hadn't in years, you know, in the past, uh, I guess, two years it had been. I Maybe, yeah, about two years I hadn't channeled the spirits. And I was at the temple and the, um, uh, we called him Pai de Santo. He was the main medium that was, calling on my spirit guide and this girl next to me just went wild with dancing but she slapped me on the face twice and it it was you could tell it was done on purpose she was the way she did it and it just I couldn't concentrate I couldn't bring myself to to become possessed we didn't call it that but to channel the spirit guide and I, I just was so devastated that I couldn't Receive my spirit guide. It was like now heartbreaking said, for me. Now you say in your written testimony that the girl was mounted by right, been a spirit. Call. Yeah, we call it. Was, was she mounting. pretending? Was she uh, pretending, or was she literally mounted? Well, she was. I I believe she was mounted by the spirit. So. So then, then that spirit inside her was attacking you. Is what you're saying? I I. I believe that's what happened or in at the same time I didn't know because before she knew me from before and it wasn't she wasn't very uh, connected with me she didn't like me very much so I I couldn't tell honestly but it felt like she did it on purpose but yeah the spirits probably did yeah yeah she was possessed for sure yeah and then there was the, the congregation was Basically, the people there were laughing because of what was happening? Well, it, it was su- such a uh, weird thing because the first time you feel like, oh, it was an accident because she was dancing. And then the second time, you know, it kind of it came the other side and like, wow. What? And I looked up and, you know, this girl's like spinning, like, you know, because these, when these spirits possess, even when I was possessed, you just, it, it, if you ever look this up and pray f- before you do, but, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, spinning and dancing and people go just uh it's almost without eyes closed you know you you just go around this huge uh temple backwards not even bumping into anything it's i mean it's totally crazy how these spirits mm-hmm. will actually take over you know the body of the mediums of the these uh 
Um, uh, like the we, reason why I, I gravitate to this particular part of your story is because when I was in the Unity, the church, uh, Unity Church, which is mm-hmm. the American version of what you're say, talking about here, mm-hmm. uh, Luciferian uh, witchcraft, you know, whatever. Right. Um, uh, I remember in, like a lot of bad things started. At first, there was like this amazing thing, but real fast, a lot of bad things started happening. And yeah. one of the things was, I believe that I was cursed uh, in that process of hitting, getting quote unquote multiple sclerosis, in which all these mm-hmm. terrible things started happening in my body, and I think witchcraft was involved with it. And mm-hmm. I remember also just being also in the service, and uh, and this is the only time, the first time ever in a, in a quote unquote church service where people are all praying for each other, and it's all mm-hmm. love. Or a guy who was very uh, high, he was a, a high up in the Alcoholics Anonymous and mm-hmm. part, of the new, uh, part of the Unity Church and had written numerous books that many people have read who have been in drug rehab and that, who turned around and started calling me, this ter- just basically told me to F off and this, that, and everything oh. else in the middle of the church. And I didn't do anything. I was just sitting there. And I just was like, wow, that, and I just laughed at the time. And so, well, yeah. that's the first time I ever had anybody swear at me like that in the church, you know. Yeah. I always remember this guy, you know, because, you know, you're thinking this way, and you're trying to be real positive, and it's right. just like all this nonsense, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, um, yeah, so I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking about also about how when I got hit with the MS that the uh, that there was zero compassion in that place oh, because yeah. it's like, well, it's your fault because mm-hmm. you did something wrong. Karma. Yeah. We, yeah. Whatever, yeah. you know, it was we your fault. In that too. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. and so, and I, and then, then I did have one of them pray for me, pray over me. And I'm just like, uh-uh. I, I look back now and I'm like, geez, I was just demonized completely and probably mm-hmm. demon possessed, you know, yes. And although I still have the you know physical uh, things of MS, I'm still able to walk, and I'm still fighting the good fight you know, by the grace of God. And I think mm-hmm. it's going to be because He wants me to do what I'm doing, you know. Um, but uh, yeah. uh, but you know, my point bringing this all up is is because then you hear you are there, and you're trying mm-hmm. to connect, and mm-hmm. this girl gets demonized. This is how it works. I mean, this is how it works with these yeah. you know these, these new age. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, religions and these witchcraft. You know, it's like the, the girl de- being demonized, maybe demon possessed, oh, yeah. having an issue with you. Sure, was your... And then everyone else laughing, and so it just goes yeah. to show you how how phony the whole thing is. Yes, uh, it wasn't no long- everyone, uh, but there was there were definitely like that gasp, like wow, you know, did this ha- just happen? And then a couple of you know snickering, like. You could hear, I don't know, it wasn't the whole congregation laughing, but there was definitely some people there laughing. And, you no, know, that thought no was, was funny. You. No one was helping huh? you or that girl. No one was helping you or that girl. No, I mean, that's, no, no, so they, no. They were enjoying the show. That's what yes. they were doing. Yeah. In love. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was, it's sad. But but that, that was the last time, because we were only visiting Brazil, of course, and that was the last time I attended the Umbanda Temple. And my, my, back then, Lord. my husband's, um, my husband's grandmother, we were dating at the time, she, like I mentioned earlier, she was a, a priestess, and she also channeled uh, spirits in the, um, uh, not Umbanda, but the um, uh, King Banda, Kondomblé, Kondomblé uh, sect. So she became possessed, you know, she's channeled her spirit guides at her house. And she told me, well, the guy, you know, the spirit, the demon, told me that I was not to go back to the United States with my open chakra, my open body, open to receive any spirit guides because it was too dangerous and I was away from, a, you know, um, a place where mediums were there to, to call on the right uh, entities so she performed a, a ritual to close off my chakra, to close off my body. And and I returned to the United States believing that I no longer was able to, to be possessed. But I, of course, you know, I was, it was too late by now. This is just, uh, it's, it, spirits, they don't, 
they don't believe in these things, these demons. You know, they, they had a hold of me, and I was possessed. But I didn't know that. And I came back to the United States and we got married a year later. I was only 19 when my husband and I got married. And I didn't practice uh, as far as going anywhere or, or receiving the, any spirit guides, but I continued believing and, and worshiping these gods in my own way, you know, always singing to them or even though I hid away a lot of the, the paraphernalia, I would still go at times when I needed. I would would I would pray. I'd never pray to God. I would pray to my goddess, to hear my job for help, and do incense. And I even started bringing my children. Eventually, you know, I had my son four years later, my daughter, and I brought them up in this belief. Even though they were American, they were kids born here in America, and I would give them, you know, herbal baths keep you know the uh, a negative energy away from them and but as the years progressed um my um the attacks intensified and i believed that it was because i wasn't practicing what god had given me the gift that god had given me and the, the spirit guides were angry and they were attacking us because i needed to turn back to them and i had to turn my back on them because I wasn't participating in any rituals on a regular basis or, or allowing them to possess me. So I would do what we did all our lives was, you know, incense on the house, uh, put salt in the corners of the rooms and get herbs to keep away the, the evil spirits, whatever, the, you know, the angry gods. And this went on and on for, for years. And I, I, progressively became uh, very sick too i was um i didn't know but i i was so tired all the time uh I, i'm a nurse and i worked in the operating room and I, I basically all i could do was work my shift i could barely take care of my kids in in the house and cook it was a, a struggle for me to come home from work and do anything and I, you know i was young i was young, young at that time in, in my 30s early 30s and I just couldn't function until I was diagnosed with um, Hashimoto's my thyroid hypothyroidism wasn't working properly so I I had no energy whatsoever but anyways besides that we all experienced very crazy uh, paranormal phenomenon around the house not only myself but my family my parents my sister we all had weird things happening all around us and but in our house, it was really heavy. It was my husband and I would be sleeping, and it was a constant thing where there would be like a pounding on the wall right above our bed that we would jump out of bed. Uh, there was always, always noises, always uh, shadows, always this uh, oppression. It was so heavy, heavy. It was progressively getting worse. I was so depressed. And it affected my marriage, my relationship. I, I had anger issues. I was a very angry, um, violent person. I never hit my kids, but, it, I mean, of course, you know, spanking, you know, when they were slapping them in the butt or anything, something like that. But I was never violent towards them. But I was, I would just lose it to the point that I, I I didn't even know how angry I was until after it passed. Like I would throw things across the room and just lose it for no reason. And everybody walked on eggshells around me because I was so, everybody, my, my entire family, I, I was getting to the point that I was losing control of everything. I had no control of my emotions, of my life, of my schedule. And the kids were scared of me because of my outbursts. You know, even though I, I I didn't hurt them physically, I was hurting them emotionally, mentally. My husband just put up with me. I don't know why. You know, he was a very patient man because I was out of control. And, and it got to the point that I was thinking, what am I going to do? I'm going to kill myself. I was contemplating suicide because it was like, I don't want to live like this anymore. There's nothing for me. All I saw was like a black pit in front of me. And I had no, I was dead dead inside. I had no 
no joy, no life. And it was getting to the point that I just couldn't stand it anymore. But I just lived my life because, I, you know, I just, all I could think was, my, well, my kids, they need me. My kids need me. And um, that's when the the pastor came into our lives, the Brazilian pastor. So. Well, I can definitely relate to what you're going through, and I know other people that are going through the same thing. So mm-hmm. and it's uh, really uh, the the physical, the spiritual, and the physical oppression that these demonic entities mm-hmm. cause is just—it's so real, and it's. Uh-huh. Um, it's horrible. It's, I know, and it's uh, we got we got it, lots of things in common, don't we? <laughs> yeah. And, and, yeah, you understand. You went through it. You're going. You you know exactly. It doesn't matter what it's called. If it's called the Banda, if it's the Uja board, or whatever you know, tarot cards, whatever it is, you're opening up these portals to these demons to just come into your life and 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 do havoc in your in your life. And the sad thing is that. It, you know they had they don't care you know it's like it's demons they'll they'll attack and destroy like the you know where God says they come to steal kill the in and that's it um my kids were affected you know by by all this they were scared they they sensed all this evil in the house you know one day uh we heard crash like breaking glass we thought somebody had thrown a rock through the window. And it was the middle of the night. We went through the whole house. And it happened more than once, but this was like we thought it was a window. But you, we heard things falling or breaking, but never found anything out of place, you know. And so this went on for, for a long time. But um, if you want me to go on now to the part of where we were saved and God had mercy on us. So I don't know if you have any other questions about this before we we move on well i got lots of them but let's 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 move on to the uh mm-hmm. the miracle and the solution in your life here Amen. Uh, okay that's the best that. part <laughs> that's the part mm-hmm. that matters yeah well my my parents my dad own they still own it it's still here a, a, a printing shop a little mom and pop shop in kissimmee florida and my sister worked there and we had the sign on the you know window that spoke Portuguese. There's a huge Brazilian uh, population in in Florida and, and especially in the Orlando area, Miami too. But so we had port you know we speak Portuguese, speak Spanish, and a lot of the clientele were were from Brazil. So this Brazilian pastor came to he had just arrived from Brazil, couldn't speak any English, and he was sent here by the Methodist Church as a missionary because there's so many Brazilians in the area. So he came to the printing shop to get some business cards done, and he had heard that we were from Brazil. So he met my sister, and he came in at the time that she was just devastated, going through some really hard hard things in her life. Uh, my nephew, who was a teenager, was um, doing drugs, uh, nothing major i mean drugs are drugs but he was this very intelligent child that uh was um gifted in school and had all everything going for for him and then right before graduating two months before graduating from high school his whole life fell apart he started doing drugs he quit high school he had everything going for him and he he got his uh he was 17 he got his girlfriend pregnant who was, I think she was 15 at the time. And my sister was devastated. His Her son, you know, who had all this um, going, for, everything going for him, and all of a sudden that, this, her life fell apart. Not only did he quit school, he was doing drugs, and she's going to be a grandmother. She's 30, I don't know, 8 years old, some 37 years old, something like that. So she didn't, again, you know, we didn't know what, where to turn. Everything was just devastating and and I found out later my son who's close to age to my nephew they, he was also doing drugs my son told me later and going to very dangerous places you know but God is so merciful uh, thinking back when we look back now how merciful and how 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 much grace he had because 
nobody deserves, you know, God is, he's good because he loves us, not because we deserve anything. But anyways, my the <laughs> pastor walked in and uh, met my sister and for some reason she opened up to him. She had never met a pastor before, never been witnessed to as far as we know, as far as I re- no, nobody had ever witnessed to her either, not to me. And he told her about Jesus Christ right there at the counter of the printing shop. And Amen. she, yeah, she was just open. She was totally open to, to salvation, to who Jesus Christ was. And, and with a very open, pure heart, she immediately believed and received Jesus Christ and and she, he prayed with her, and she accepted Christ right there. And later on, he spoke to my nephew, and this kid, you know, 17-year-old kid, was also open and also accepted Christ. And Amen. It was, it was, Michael, I'm telling you, it was such a miraculous movement that this pastor, and I'll say his name. His name is, I did not put his name on my testimony. Uh, because I hadn't, I didn't, I haven't spoken to him in many, many years. He's in Brazil now, and I didn't have his permission. But now he um, read my testimony, and he said that if I need to use his name, so his name is Alexandre Alexander Oberlander, and he was a man of God that God used powerfully in not only my life, my entire family's life, but many, many people's lives here in. in um, because he's from Brazil, he knew the culture and he understood all the ins and outs of these belief systems that we had that were demonic, you know. So he prayed with my nephew also. He my nephew accepted Christ. And when my sister called me, I was I was so angry. And I was you know, being demonically possessed, of course I was gonna be angry that I didn't want anything to do with this this pastor and the first thing that came to my mind was all religion was uh, about money and all he wanted was to take money from my parents and, and you know, he was a charlatan and how could she believe that my nephew was cured from drug use when I took him myself to so many sessions, you know, trying to get him to quit and trying to get him help and nothing ever helped and just a man comes along and prays and boom, everything. I, I could not get past that, you know, and I was very demonized. I was so angry with my entire family for even entertaining this. And, you know, when my sister said that she believed in in Jesus Christ and she started talking, you know, the Christianese, I was like, what are you talking about? Before that, a cousin in in Massachusetts had become a Christian and she called me and I thought she was joking. She said, I'm a Christian now, I'm, a, I'm born again. And I remember laughing on the phone, thinking she was joking with me and not believing her. But um, yeah, she was she was saved uh, before we were, a couple years before, but wasn't able to witness because that, we were not open to it at all. And she was, you know, in Massachusetts, but she was the first one in our family. But anyway, so then uh, the pastor started speaking to my parents. My parents were also resistant, but not as, they, they listened, you know, and they were still not ready to accept, but they were willing to listen to what he was uh, teaching and preaching. And, and so one day, and I was so angry with everyone that they were welcoming this stranger into our family. And I hadn't met him yet, but I couldn't stand him. And so when my sister invited me to go to coffee to meet him. I didn't want to go, but then, you know, this, you can hear the spirit, you know, these demons talking to you. It's like, you need to go and, and make sure that you get rid of him and he doesn't hurt your family. Cause I thought he was there to hurt us. Uh-huh. And so I, I remember going to my sister's house and meeting him and I couldn't stand the sight of this poor guy. You know, uh, it was, it was just like impossible to even be in the same room with him. And just, it was, it disgusted me, you know, to be around uh, this preacher. So they were drinking coffee and um, he started talking about God and Jesus and salvation and the Bible. And I just, immediately I wanted to leave. I couldn't be around it. And I just told my husband, just finish what you, you know, you're 
eating and I'm going to go outside. I smoked at the time. I'm going to have a cigarette and we're going to leave. So the the pastor followed me outside in the patio and with a Bible in hand. And I'm like, what is this man doing? He was, God used this, uh, his personality because he was very bold and he was very uh, in your face because I I was, my, my personality was so strong that I, Anyone that was a little bit meeker probably would have confronted me like he did. And he wasn't afraid. He knew, you know, that he was talking to someone that was demonically possessed. And he he knew he had that experience, like I said, from Brazil being, you know, raised in that culture. He knew about spiritism and what we believed and how the Bible teaches us that it's all demonic. So um, he came out and he was telling me, trying to talk to me, and I didn't want anything to do with him. And he was saying, you know, these spirits are not spirit guides. There's no such thing. These are demons. You're actually allowing demons to come into your house, to your your body, and you're you're hurting your family. And you're you you know you need to understand that Christ died for us, and he his blood was poured on the cross for our salvation and we only live eternal life through him and so I went back inside and we had a discussion about argument really because I was arguing about uh my belief in reincarnation it was crazy how all my it, that, that was part of my my being like how can you not how can you tell me something I believed all my life isn't true and you know especially if I didn't believe in the bible it was it was like I had this wall, and I was just getting really angry, angry with this man. And he, when he read that passage to me, when I argued uh, reincarnation with him, he read the passage in the Bible about um, you're only to live, to die once, and then judgment. Right. And that and that was. Something happened in my spirit that just there was like this little glint of like what you know interest. What does that mean? And it, it was, you know, the word of God is powerful, and you know it's a sword, and it did pierce through something. It did pierce through my soul, my spirit at that time that um, it allowed my my wall to come down a little bit even though I still refuse to believe and I refuse to listen or pray or, you know, I just wanted to leave. So he was also leaving. He said, well, you know, I want to pray before I leave and um, maybe we can meet again someday. And I'm thinking, yeah, right. I'm never going to meet you again. And I didn't want to pray either. I didn't want anything to do with prayer, but my, my father had was so tired of my attitude and everybody was so embarrassed. You know, my husband, I was so rude. And so they basically grabbed my hand and they said, "No, we're gonna pray." So uh, this is my, my the kids were upstairs. My son, uh, my nephew, you know, they're teenagers, they're, and my daughter and my niece they were all upstairs. And I didn't know this. Uh, oh, this happened later. Yeah, but they were upstairs. They didn't see what happened at that time. But my um. So as soon as he started praying, I felt the manifestation, just like I did when uh, I was to receive the spirit guide in the, in the temple. And I'm thinking in my head, I'm thinking, what is going on? And I'm blaming this guy for doing this when, in fact, it was, you know, the, the demon was manifesting because it was angry, you know, of what was going on. And, it, and I became possessed right there in my sister's living room. And nobody, um, my husband had never seen that happen. I, and you know, because when we were in Brazil together, like I said, I never was able to to receive the spirit guide during the the temple, the the time the girl hit me. So he had never seen me become possessed or receive what I thought was a spirit guide, and I was just um, it, it just I remember it, it was kind of in and out of consciousness because there a lot of times when I became possessed, I did lose consciousness. And it, it, things were blurry, and I, you remember some things, some things you don't. 
So I remember kind of like hearing like voices and kind of going back and forth into consciousness and just, I think I, from what my husband described, I was um, dancing around the room like I did in the temple, kind of going backwards and just, and he said I was totally distorted. You know, you become totally, and I've seen that now after becoming a Christian, how people, when they become possessed, they, the, the features change. You can actually see the manifestation of evil in them when that manifestation of the spirit comes through. So he, my husband was horrified. He had never seen it before. He said I was all twisted and horrible. And I kept begging my father to tell the pastor to stop praying because he just kept praying in Jesus' name, leave you know he was uh casting the spirit out but i was fighting it i didn't want to i was also not helping the 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 spirit to leave because i i didn't want him to i didn't want the spirit because i thought it was my spirit guy and it was i remember just being sick i was sweating my heart was pounding and and i i thought i was going to pass out it was so horrible and Finally, my father said to the pastor, stop, whatever you're doing, stop, leave, leave her alone. And and I remember just feeling like coming out of that trance because it was in and out of a trance, coming completely out of the trance and running to my sister's bathroom. And I was I vomited and it was um, so weird, Michael. I didn't know anything about this, but I read later on uh, that it can happen where uh, people, when they um, – when uh, they go through deliverance, a lot of times they they vomit, and it was just it was just a clear substance. And I had just had coffee. It was so weird. I couldn't understand what I had vomited. I'm a nurse, and you would think you know I would vomit coffee. I just had coffee. But so instead of thinking, okay, maybe this man has something. Um, this you know maybe this truth to what he's saying. I, I got angrier and, and left saying that I I would never want to see him again. I never wanted to see him again. But my uh, husband kept, he was so horrified by the whole thing that he, he started to believe that Jesus was real and what we did was demonic, that this was not from God. And we started arguing about it because my, by now my family is all, you know, converted and this, they started this even helped my parents to believe that we were serving Satan and the pastor introduced us uh, them to Christ and they accepted Christ. And so there was a big clash with me and my family because here I am possessed being around people that were Christians. It was a really bad situation, you know, uh, and I already told you I had a very bad temper, but, um, my husband begged me to allow the pastor to come to the house to pray, and and I finally agreed. There was a, a my nephew and my my son did take a peek, and and they saw part of it. I think you know they heard the noise and they saw me being possessed. And, and my nephew even today, when he talks about it, he gets like goosebumps. He gets. He said he never saw anything. He was so scared. And they were teenagers, and my and my son. He said that when he saw that happen, he believed and he talked to the priest that that helped him to convert because he he never thought that was real. He never thought it was true. And so by I'm the only one in my family, my media family that are still not uh, converted and I'm still not believing. But because my husband and my son, and I heard these things from the rest of the family, I was like, fine. He can come and pray, but that's one time he can come and pray, and that's it. I don't want anything to do with him anymore. And then you guys leave me alone because you guys are deceived. It's a lie. So when he came to the house, um, and I think I didn't put this in the the uh, the second time that he came, that I met him. I didn't put in my um, testimony I, I, it, because it was getting so long, but he basically came to pray just like he did at my sister's house and the same thing happened again. I, I became possessed and angry and and he just said if I wasn't willing to to uh, go along with, you know, at least 
accept Christ and, and allow Christ to, to free me from this bondage, then if I kept holding on to it, then he, you can't force anyone to be delivered. I mean, you can have a spirit cast out of them, but like the Bible says, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit and you leave that open, you know, you can even have seven more demons come. It will get worse. Your situation, spiritual situation will get worse demonically. So you can't, like a lot of times people will have these uh, paranormal investigators that will cast out demons from the house. But, uh, you, you, only Jesus Christ can do that. Only Jesus Christ can free us from the occult, from the demonic. Only his through his blood because we we can't depend on anything else except Jesus Christ to to, to save us from from this from these demons from this demonic attacks and for some reason um I finally thought okay what am i doing i'm hurting my ch-. and god started to work in my heart and and i know they were praying my family they were fasting they were praying for me and my heart started to soften and I started to have a lot of doubts about what I believed on my life. And I agreed to have a session of deliverance, even though I, I had no idea what that meant. But I said, fine, I'll do it. And it was uh, 21, exactly 21 years ago, this Saturday, uh, Saturday was the Saturday before Easter that um, he came to my house with his wife and I didn't know my sister came later for the deliverance and by now I was already accepting that yes uh this I need to be free from this these are demons this this is not from God and and we were deceived and I actually started to read the bible that he gave me but that day, the, the day of my deliverance, I, I couldn't. I, I was there was so much attack that my my brain was like filled with. Um, I could almost hear the voices of the demons just telling me to run away, run away. Um, my husband had to leave with my kids; they couldn't be at the house, and they went to my sister's house to be with the rest of the family to be in prayer and fasting. And I was at home by myself waiting for the pastor to come it was scheduled for five o'clock and i tried to pray i couldn't pray because i I was just totally oppressed i tried to open the bible i couldn't even touch the bible and all i had was like run away run away this is a trap you need to run i mean the voices were just like get out of here get out of here and I remember grabbing my keys and heading for the garage. And as soon as I opened the door to the, go to the garage, they were standing, you know, the pastor and his wife were standing right there with the Bible. And I'm thinking, "Uh oh, (laughs) I can't go anywhere now. But they came in and um, that's when the the deliverance um, began. So I don't know if you want to ask anything else before I talk to you about the deliverance or. Uh, yeah, let's let's hear about the deliverance. Okay. Let's do that. So, okay. Uh, the the pastor had his wife with him, and all he said is, "You know, we're going to pray first. I'm going to anoint you with the oil, and we're going to cast the demons out. Uh, Jesus Christ is your savior." And and so I remember just still being honestly michael i was still back and forth like what am i doing is this real i i was i still had doubts i i it was uh a, a very uh it was just so much conflict going on right in my in my brain in my head and you know spiritually the it was there was a battle it was a huge huge spiritual battle going on and um i he started to pray and it was five o'clock when they arrived, five o'clock in the afternoon. And he started to pray. And I remember he went to anoint me with the oil. All I remember is kind of hearing myself screech. And then I was in a trance. And I was in and out of consciousness, back and forth. Like, But all I remember that I can tell you that I remember is going through um, my house 
and just going through drawers and picking out things that were um, occult, that had any um, attachments to, that demons had attachments to. You know, I had books, um, occultic books, jewelry, uh, uh, things on my walls. I had um, saints, you know, all kinds of uh, statues, um, the beads, whatever uh, was occult. I was going through and just gathering these things and I remember like I said going back and forth into trances and hearing the pastor pre, uh, pray sometimes his wife would pray and and it was kind of it's kind of like a dream like when you have a dream and you remember certain parts and everything else is kind of blurry and then um, I remember there, there was a section that I actually went outside <laughs> This is so crazy, digging up dirt because I had a, a saint that was uh, we're trying to sell the house. And, of course, besides all this beliefs, we were superstitious. And I buried a saint upside down to sell my house. It's like this Catholic, I, I don't remember if it's St. Joseph or they, they say, oh, if you bury the saint upside down. So I actually went outside digging up the statue of the saint. Because everything had to be burned. Everything that was consecrated to Satan had to be burned. And I, the next part is, let me see. I remember that he, oh, okay. I remember screeching again, hearing myself kind of screech, and I opened my eye, and I just remember seeing it. It was very bright, like when you look in the sun. And I remember the pastor had a, a cross and he was, you know, screaming at the, the demon to come out of me, you know, in the name of Jesus Christ. And I remember just seeing this very bright light and and I remember covering my face with my arm because it was blinding, blinding light. But then my sister said that um, what happened at that time, because she, she gave me a lot of details and the pastor later on about what, what was going on during this period of the deliverance and she said that he had a crucifix and he put it on top of my head or my forehead and the demon was laughing hysterically like just laughing like crying laughing mocking you know Christ and then he took the empty cross and declared that the cross is empty that Jesus Christ rose on the third day that we have eternal life that his blood was uh, was shed for us and uh, the demon started screaming and she said that it was so, she said it was like a horror movie because it was saying, don't burn me, don't burn me. I don't remember any of that, but that's what my sister, you know, and, and the pastor and his wife told me later on. So next thing I remember is hearing him say again scream very loud you know, to for the spirit to the demon to leave in the name of Jesus Christ and it felt I guess the best way I can explain it the way I wrote it is that there's like a bomb went off because I literally went up into the air and I flew backwards into my hallway and I felt I remember feeling that like flying backwards like boom and falling on my back, uh, crashing on the on the tile floor. And the minute I opened my eyes, I was free. And I can't even describe the feeling. I, I, I tried to describe it in writing, but I had no pain, which was the, the first thing I thought was, I, I'm, you know, when I fell, I thought I was going to be hurt, but I, I had no pain at all. I, I woke, I got up and I opened my eyes and, and I'm looking at, it's, I felt like a veil was being lifted, like, because all my life, since I was a little girl, I just remember seeing everything with kind of like a, a gray film. I can't, literally, I had like a gray film over my eyes my entire life. And when this happened, as soon as I, the demon was cast out, or demons, because it was more than one, the, the veil was lifted. And I remember looking around and I was shocked to see my sister there crying. And I was like, what are you doing here? And the pastor and his wife, you know, she, his wife was crying too. And they were like, 
covered in sweat. And I'm looking around the house, like, everything looks so bright. Everything, I, I, I felt even the colors, everything was so bright. And I just looked around, like, I, I felt, this is what it is. I'm born, I'm, I'm, I felt like I was a new person. I was. I was free from all this bondage of, of since I was born, of this demon possession that, that just kept me in, and changed all my life, and it was such a relief. It was so peaceful and so happy. I, I, I never felt so good in my life. I, op- I looked and I looked at the clock, and I thought, no, it can't be. It was two o'clock in the morning, so the process took eight hours. And this isn't. Um, I, I want to talk about this later too, Michael. If you remind me, please. But. This is how God used it in my situation. It's not the same for everybody, but this is how this is what happened. It was eight hours of the process. It took a long time, and I believe it's because I was still not ready to to let it go. I believe there was a, a lot of, you know, and it was something that I carried with me from birth. It was my 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 entire life. I had served, even unknowingly served, the enemy. So, um, when, you know, we're, we're there in the house and my husband and my, my kids came home at like two o'clock in the morning, a little bit after two, you know, my, uh, we called them, we're done. And they walked in and the first thing my husband's like, what is this? You know, he saw these garbage bags filled with stuff. You know, the walls were all empty because pretty much everything I had on the wall was occultic. And he um, said, something's burning, something's burning. And was like, the pastor's like, no, 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 that's nothing burning. That's because you could smell sulfur and smoke throughout the house, especially where, you know, I fell. That area was just like, it smelled just like something was burning. And the pastor said, no, that's, that's from the, the deliverance. Don't worry. And my husband didn't believe him and ran to the refrigerator, pulled the refrigerator away from the wall thinking that we had an electrical fire because it was so strong, the smell. And uh, so my husband, you know, he's still, to this day, he's, he says how he really believed that there was a fire in the house or something burning behind the refrigerator because it was in that area. But um, so after that, I I was able to completely, you know, I accepted Christ, gave my life to him and, my life has never been the same, you know, perfect. No, because like we said, just because we serve Christ doesn't mean we're going to have a perfect life, but I wouldn't change it for anything. I, this is the happiest. Uh, there's nothing like serving Christ, just being saved and delivered from, from all this oppression and, and, and darkness. It's just, this. there's nothing like it. And I pray for anyone that's involved in the occult to be free from this because it's it's dead it's it's this only death serving uh, Satan there's no you know that hopelessness that people feel and it's all from that's all Satan can give us is hopelessness everything that that's opposite from God is what Satan will give us so so that was the deliverance, and after that, I, I never turned. I, I, I just want, wanted to serve God, and, and we became part of the church, and you know, I went on mission trips, and and I just loved the Lord, and I'm just so grateful for His mercy on us. Just, I can't even put into words how how grateful to God for just not just for myself, but for my family. And for, you know, anyone that we can touch through this message or any, and my, my testimony or, you know, all these other ministries, yours, that, you know, that there's freedom in Christ and and that Satan has no power over us through his blood. So, but that was my deliverance and I praise God for that 21 years ago. Amen. Amen. Oh, a little over 21 years ago. That is awesome. What a wonderful story. And uh, yeah. Yeah. What, a, what, a, what a blessing. And, you know, I know everything you're saying is true 
for numerous reasons, from the fact mm. that, from my own experience, from the Holy Spirit actually tells me, mm. and uh, because me being in spiritual warfare, I know that the demons are mm. really upset. Yeah, I can tell they're trying yeah. to distract me. So, anyways, uh, this has been a wonderful experience. I really do appreciate the so uh, the time. Uh, it's going on close to two hours, so. I, um, Wow. But you know what? I, what I want to do is I actually want you to come back, and I want you to actually, if you're willing to do it, and if it's all right with you, mm-hmm. actually read out your testimony so we can put it in a recording so people can hear it, okay. because it is kind of a long testimony, which is nothing is. wrong with that. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. It actually, it should be this way, mm-hmm. but because people are all where they're at. And sometimes, you know, we live in a, in a day and age where hardly anybody ever reads anymore. True. Uh, That's what I've been told uh, that. Please record it. My cousins in Massachusetts, I'm at, record it because people don't read it and and it's long. So, and So, yes, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I, want you to come back. I, I want you to come back and, and read that. I'm going to have two recordings, one reading it, mm-hmm. and then you could either come back later um and read it again, and then kind of add the little pieces that the mm-hmm. uh, that the Holy Spirit tells you. And you can also do that with the first reading, but you know, the, adding the little more things that maybe, yeah, mm-hmm. forgot. And so, if it's sure. recorded, I think mm-hmm. this message is going to get out to a lot more people. I mean, this has been wonderful you sharing this, and I do appreciate. It. I relate so Thank much you. to what you're you're talking about Thank in my you. own life, and. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's only Jesus Christ. This is mm-hmm. it. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it's your only hope in this whole mess. And you know, and then looking mm-hmm. at the spiritual warfare that I have people around me, and it's like, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I see how the spirit, um, mm-hmm. the Holy Spirit agitates these folks around me. Mm-hmm. I don't have the same thing. It, I just being be in the presence, like you were talking about that pastor. Yeah. Like to be in the presence, and it's just like everything, all hell breaks loose. I don't even have to do yeah. it. <laughs> That's true. I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, I, but, you know, then there's also, you know, the demons manifest with inside them, and it's like, you mm-hmm. know, uh, it is what it is. I guess it's uh, been a good reminder for me that it's just how real the spiritual warfare is it's, in many it's fronts. Very I've, been foc- I've been focusing so much on the enemy itself that I haven't mm-hmm. really spent much time about the. Uh, what the consequences are, really, what people go through, you know. Mm-hmm. So you 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 have shed light on uh, a few things for me, and when I look at what's going on with my uh, my son and his sister and his mother, and why they run away from me so fast. Mm-hmm. And I go, oh, God, you know, I haven't done anything to these people. Why do they always like go go? They don't want to be around my presence at all. It's like are they. They're totally convinced that I'm the worst human being on the planet, but it's really not them. It's these demons convincing them that I am. And I think this is like, stay away from him because he's going to start talking about Jesus if you let him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that happens. There's a lot of division when <laughs> when we come to Christ and our, our people in our families are not saved, There's a, unfortunately. But uh, God you, you, can control. You had a very interesting, complete opposite. So your whole family came first and then you yes. came and obviously yes. that was needed that was needed for you because uh uh you had a legion of demons in you is what you had <laughs> legion it was that's what the pastor said it was we say you know it's uh, uh a demon but it, there were yeah there's there's uh, they work in in cahoots you know they they have networks and they're that's why uh, hopefully we can get into this next time that people don't understand how these mediums can tell what happened in the past or what happened, you know, to your, um, what do you have hidden in a drawer? Because they see everything. They've been here since the beginning of time. And they know us more than we know ourselves. So they can tell you what your grandmother looked like or what your baby was wearing or, you know, they're evil. So that's how uh, mediums can, can project these these things and it, people believe it's from God. No, it's from demons. Because you know the Bible prohibits um, us to to seek um, the dead for any any um, information, and and we, there's many many passages, you know, in Deuteronomy and throughout the Bible, the New Testament, to not mess with necromancy, with mediums, 
uh, tarot cards. It doesn't say tarot cards specifically, but it's the same thing. You know, Ouija boards that kids play with, it's not a joke. It's very serious. So, and, you know, it's like, but you were mentioning uh, about focusing so much on, on, sometimes on the devil or Satan, but it's like C.S. Lewis said, you know, one, there's two things that, that Satan or the demons would like humans to do either to have a, a great fascination with demons that they see demonic activity behind everything or not believe in it at all. And I think that part of a lot of Christians, you know, have that and not believe in is very dangerous either because that's not something that's discussed in the church. And, and, I think that God is raising up people like yourself, Laura Maxwell, you know, I, I love her, her her ministry, Mark Hahnemann, who has that book, I mean, I, his book is, is brilliant, uh, Seeing Ghosts at Girl's Size, and uh, so many other people that, uh, we, you know, are, are being raised to expose the lies of the enemy and the occult. And usually it's people like us, like yourself, that's been involved in it somehow, and you know, we can see a little bit better, but the church needs to to teach people because there's it's it's getting to the point that it's infiltrating everywhere. It's in the schools, it's in churches, it's everywhere, and people are just falling for you know the satanic lies of the occult. Very dangerous. So, but thank you so much, Michael. I really really appreciate yes. this opportunity. Let's see, if I, let's, see, let's see if I can get your name right here. It's Ivani. <laughs> Grippy. Grippy. Uh-huh. Yeah. Grippy. You got it. Yep. Well, I Grippy. almost got it. I didn't quite get it right. But anyways, <laughs> it was, don't take it personally. I, I butcher everybody's name. I, I even butcher my own name. <laughs> I'm one of those, you know, those, those people, you know, the, the parents that even butchers. <laughs> well, I actually haven't been too bad with my son's name, but actually, it's just, I know I'm just bad with names. Um. Anyways, uh, yeah, you got, so you got your, uh, Ivani. Grepe, mm-hmm. Grepe, Grepe, Grepe. I never Grepe. said to say it right. At Word, WordPress.com, you can see her, her testimony on um, also Laura Maxwell. Yes. Um, Laura Sp- our spiritual Our spiritual quest dot com. Yes. And mm-hmm. I'm hopefully you will come and join me uh, real soon to actually record your testimony so I could then. You can put it on yours, and then you can put it on Laura's, and anyone else wants to put it on their, you know, their mm-hmm. YouTube channel or, or, or um, you know, their their blog or whatever their website. So I think this is a very important testimony, and it's mm-hmm. true. I know it's praise true, God. and it's uh, yeah, praise mm-hmm. God, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And uh, before we call, we close all close out in prayer. Is all with you? Oh yes, please. All right. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, Almighty God, uh, thank you for introducing me to uh, a true sister in Christ, and her, and thank you for uh, uh, blessing us with uh, to hear her testimony uh, about the power and authority of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that His precious blood had uh, saved her from the the grips of the oppression of the demonic realm which is real god god i ask of you humbly that this message will go out to those who need to hear it for there are many for there are billions of people out there who are oppressed by these things and many of them are your children and need to be known to know, know the truth about this and that it's not just a fable fantasy or speculation it's the real deal Life 101, first, that Jesus is the Christ, mm-hmm. our Lord and Savior, that God, as it says in the first chapter of John, that even if the, our Lord created all things, being us too, and that we must put our faith in our Creator, in our God, and not in the whims, the fables, the philosophies, the religions of the dark side, because all they're designed to do is snare us and trap us. Now, God, I was thinking about where we're listening, uh, Giovanni, about uh, reincarnation. And, you know, there is a dirty lie 
a satanic and demonic lie about reincarnation. Yeah. Or there is a reincarnation, but it's not you coming back here over and over again. It's not somebody coming back in, in the physical flesh. No. In hell. Mm-hmm. What the reincarnation will be is yeah. that you will be tormented over and over and over again. That's the reincarnation. Mm-hmm. That these demonic entities, they want nothing more than to kill, steal, and destroy us and send us to hell with them so they can torment us on an endless basis. I hope people take this seriously, God. Amen. Take it more seriously than anything they ever learned in this world. Because what we're doing is we're speaking the truth, not a religion, Amen. not some philosophy, God, but your truth. And it's a simple thing to do. Yes. You didn't ask anything except for what was good for us, God, that you would ask them to, this is John 3.16, you so love the world that you gave your only begotten son, that whoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's really that Hallelujah. simple. And as uh, Ivani says, you know, it's it's not it, it's not an easy walk at times to walk the straight and narrow path, only because you know you use that to teach us to remind us of how, what a great blessing and promise of salvation and eternal life with you is going to be, and that there's only one way. And thank mm-hmm. goodness there's only one way in the end. So yeah. you're not you're not the author of confusion, God, that's for sure. You're an awesome God. You're an awesome God that allows me to meet folks like Lonnie and and so many others who are true believers in your God. And if it wasn't for you, I'd be stuck probably in some religion thinking that I was doing the best that I could do mm-hmm. instead of realizing if I just handed it over to you, you could do a miracle. Yeah. And you're doing that, God. So mm-hmm. I ask you to please bless Ivani and her family and all those around her. I've asked them to protect them, protect them from the evil one and as many minions. Bind those stinking rotten, no good for nothing, foul smelling, ugly looking things. Amen. And uh, God, please Amen. listen to thy angels, listen to thy angels, God, to protect us from the evil one. Be our fortress, be our hedge, God. Please, Almighty God. God, there's just nothing, there's no other hope outside of you. Heavenly Father, what an amazing God you are, and I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait to be with my Lord and my King. Okay. And actually to be in the presence of truth and in love, have real meaning, to have no more pain and suffering, to have no more lies, no more deceptions, and to be in the way, the truth, and life. I say this in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. God bless you, Michael. Thank you very much. And and may yeah. God continue to bless your ministry and everything yeah. you do in his kingdom. Same to you. Now, you stay on. Don't hang up. I'm just going to end the recording part. Okay. All which right. I'll need to refresh because we've been doing this for a couple of hours. So that's <laughs> awesome. No, it's fine. You know, that seems to be the case. It takes a, It always takes a good couple hours. <laughs> so, anyways, folks, anybody hears us, God mm-hmm. bless you. Amen. Thank you.